Rahim. Today we are going to discuss the management of the woman with the red cell antibodies during pregnancy. This is a very important RCOG guideline. Okay, so first of all, we have to discuss the pre-pregnancy counseling with a woman who had red cell antibodies, risk of red cell antibodies, means her blood group is negative. Okay, so how would we do the pre-pregnancy counseling of these women? Okay, women with the red cell antibodies, particularly if there is the risk of fetal anemia or if compatible donor red cell for transfusion may be difficult to obtain, should attend for pre-pregnancy counseling with a clinician with the knowledge and expertise of this condition because it's very important that we should tell each and every aspect of uh, rhesus negative blood group implications. Okay, now red cell antibodies in pregnancy. We have to discuss this. What red cell antibodies are clinically significant? Maternal and fetal during pregnancy. Okay, it's very important that all women should have their blood group and antibody status determined and booking uh, and uh, 28 weeks of gestation. This is for all the women. Okay, and we have to check the appendix two for some important information. Now, let us discuss the appendix two in detail where the timing and frequency of antibody screening in pregnancy is discussed. So, on the top, it's written that at booking, all the pregnant women should have a BO plus RHD typing or antibody screen. Now, coming to the right hand side, if no clinically significant antibodies are present, then repeat testing at 28 weeks. Okay, and at 28 weeks, if no antibodies, no further action is needed but if uh, clinically significant antibodies are present then we have to go to the left side okay this arrow is going to the left side and we have to follow that route at, at that time so on the left side clinical significant antibodies are present so we have to follow the two roads okay uh, depending upon the circumstances first of all if NTD small c or k antibodies are present then we have to test monthly until 28 weeks and from 28 weeks test two weekly until delivery but if we have all other clinically significant antibodies then consider paternal or fetal genotyping for corresponding antigens then repeat antibody screenings at 28 weeks okay and at the time of the birth we have to check the cord blood for what for that for hb for bilirubin and what is that that is direct anti-globulin test now coming to the implications what are the implications for the fetus and neonate from the red cell antibodies clinicians should be aware that severe fetal anemia can result in high drops which significantly worsens the perinatal outcome okay the implications are written in here okay it can cause iud it can cause fetal high drops cognitive impairment fetal distress so we need to have better understanding of the rcog guideline in order to prevent the mother suffering from these complications okay when and how should paternal and fetal genotyping be performed it's written that non-invasive fetal genotyping using maternal blood is now possible for capital d capital c small c capital e small e and k antigen so no capital d okay and this should be performed in the first instance for the relevant antigen when the maternal red cell antibodies are present now coming to the invasive testing for the further antigens invasive testing such as CVS or amniocentesis may be considered if fetal anemia is a concern or if invasive testing is performed for another reason for example karyotype okay so initially we have to perform the non-invasive then come to the invasive now question rises is karyotyping contraindicated in the presence of maternal red cell antibodies no Invasive testing is not contraindicative, uh, contraindicated if aluminization has occurred. But we have to take care that anti-D prophylaxis should be given to cover invasive testing if the mother is racist negative and is not sensitized. Now the question arises, if the fetus is at risk of anemia and when should referral to the fetal medicine specialist take place? Now we should know what are the main indications for referral to fetal medicine special. Referral to fetal medicine specialist should occur when there are rising antibody titer or a level per liter above the specific threshold or ultrasound suggestive of fetal anemia. Okay, when there is rising titer or there is level above the specific threshold or when there are ultrasound 
ultrasound features suggestive of fetal hematoma. These are three indications for referral to the fetal medicine specialist. And referral should take place if there is a history of unexplained or severe neonatal jaundice, neonatal anemia requiring transfusion, or extreme transfusion in order to exclude hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn as a cause. Okay, so these are also uh, indications. Now, for antibodies other than anti D, anti C, anti K, the following should prompt referral to a fetal medicine specialist and that include a history of the previous significant hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn or intrauterine transfusion or titer of 32 or above especially if the titer is rising or rising titer correlate with increasing risk and submarity of anemia all these are indications for referral to a fetal medicine specialist now what threshold should be used for various antibodies that could cause fetal anemia to trigger to trigger referral for the further investigation and monitoring okay we said that about the specific level we should refer so what are those levels for anti d the level of more than 4 but less than 15 correlate with a moderate risk of hemolytic disease of the fetal and newborn and anti d level of more than 15 international unit per ml can cause severe hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn refer for fetal medicine's opinion should therefore be made once anti d level on more than 4 international unit per ml okay and for anti c the um, anti c the level of more than 7.5 international unit per ml but less than 20 correlate with the moderate risk of hemolytic disease of fetus and no newborn newborn whereas anti c level of more than 20 uh, correlates with a high risk and we should refer refer for fetal medicines should therefore be made once anti c level are more than 7.5 okay so for anti d more than 4 international unit per ml and for um, NTC, uh, small c, more than 7.5 international unit per ml. These are indication for referral. Now, coming to NTK. For NTK antibodies, referral should take place once detected. Severe fetal anemia can cover, can occur even at low titer. And the presence of anti-E potentiate the severity of the fetal anemia due to anti-C antibodies. So that referral at the low level, level or title is indicated unless the fetal has only one of these antigens. Okay, so in case of the low level, if any one of these antigens is present, then no need to refer. But even at low level, if both are present, then we should refer. Now, once detected, how often should antibody level be monitored during pregnancy? Now it's written that anti-D and anti-C level should be measured every four weekly up to 28 weeks of gestation and then two weekly until delivery. We have to remember this thing. Although anti-K level do not correlate well with either the development or severity of the fetal anemia, titer should nevertheless be measured every four weeks up to 28 weeks of gestation and then two weekly until delivery. Now for all other antibodies, retesting at 28 weeks is advised with the exception of the women who have a previous history of pregnancies affected by hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn when early love referral to the fetal medicine specialist is also recommended. Now, when should the discussion with the blood transfusion services made for the uh, antibodies that could potentially cause problem with the cross matching or issues with the availability of appropriate blood discussion with the blood transfusion service is required regarding the frequency of antenatal testing and this may depend upon the type of antibody as well as the likelihood of requiring blood at the short notice how should pregnancies at the risk of fetal anemia be monitored okay about this it's written that the cause of aluminization relevant past history and pregnancy outcome should be ascertained in order to generate the assessment of risk of hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn if the fetus carries the corresponding antigen for maternal antibody which is capable of causing fetal anemia and if antibody titer is beyond this level then the pregnancy should be monitored weekly by ultrasound specifically assessing the fetal mca middle cerebral peak systolic velocities now referral to the fetal medicine specialist for consideration of invasive treatment should take place if mca peak systolic velocity rises above the 1.5 multiple of median threshold or if there are other signs of fetal anemia and fetal monitoring is required once ntk is detected 
Now something about the fetal transfusion. If fetal transfusion is required, what type of the donor blood should be used? Right cell preparation for intrauterine transfusion should be group O low titer hemolysin or ABO identical with a fetus if not. And negative for the antigen corresponding to maternal rat cell antibodies. And intrauterine transfusion should be performed in the fetal medicine units that have the requisite invasive skills and appropriate perinatal hematology expertise. Now, what are the implications for the mother from the rat cell antibodies? For the antibodies other than anti-D, anti-C, anti-capital C, anti-E and anti-K maternity staff should liaise with a local transfusion laboratory to assist the plan for any possible transfusion requirement as obtaining the relevant blood may take longer. Now, how should the high-risk woman be tested? How often should the pregnant woman, the red cell antibodies, who are at high risk of requiring transfusion, for example, placenta, previous sickle cell disease, how can these be tested? Okay, pregnant women with the red cell antibodies who are assessed as being high risk of requiring blood transfusion should have cross match sample taken at least every week. Now, if maternal transfusion is required, what type of donor blood or blood component should be used? Red cell components of the same ABO group and RSG type and the K-negative cytomegalus virus negative should be selected. Now, should anti-D negative women who have anti-capital D or anti uh, or non-anti-capital D antibodies receive routine antenatal prophylaxis or postnatal prophylaxis? It's written that anti-D immunoglobulin should be given to RSG negative women with the non-anti-D antibodies for the routine antenatal prophylaxis for potential antenatal sensitizing even and postnatal prophylaxis. Okay? If entity, immune entity is detected, then no need of prophylaxis. And it's very important that discussion lays in with the transfer laboratory and essential in determining whether entity, uh, antibodies are immune or a passive in the woman who have previously received entity prophylaxis. Now coming to the requirements of the blood. What are the logistics of obtaining blood or blood components for the woman, fetus, or units? Blood or blood components for the woman. About this, it's written that close collaboration between the maternity neonatology hematology staff is essential. And the when blood is required for the woman with the multiple antibodies or antibody against the high prevalence antigen, planning is required as the rare blood donors may be necessary, may be needed to call up to donate the uh, blood or the f uh, frozen blood may be needed to obtain from the National Frozen Blood Bank in Liverpool. Okay, we're in our country, we can use our setup. Okay, and local blood transport time and the time for the cross match should be taken into account when the scene for transfusion is made. Now, coming to the blood for intrauterine transfusion, clinicians should be aware that the blood for intrauterine transfusion has the same requirement as the blood for neonatal exchange, except that the plasma is removed by the blood centers to increase the hemat hematocrit to 0.7 to 0.85 and is always irradiated. Now, coming to the blood for neonatal exchange. Okay, blood should be ABO compatible with the new needs and mother to avoid ABO hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. RSG negative, identical uh, with the new needs and K negative. Negative for the corresponding antigen to which the woman has antibody and cross match compatible with the woman blood group. Blood sample. Along with that, blood should be less than 5 days old to ensure the uh, low super supernatin potassium level. CMV negative and irradiated unless the risk to the baby by delaying the exchange transfusion while obtaining this irradiated blood out with it. And it should all uh, so be uh, plasma reduced rather than saline adenosine glucose and mannitol additive solution with a hematocrit of 0.5 to 0.6. Now blood for neonatal small volume top of transfusion. Blood should be ABO compatible with the neonates and mother. Blood should be CMV negative and clinician considering transfusion in unit must check if the baby has had intrauterine transfusion. Now, what blood or blood components can be administered in emergency situation? Okay, that decision should be made on the balance of the risks and benefit of each uh, circumstances. And transfusion should not be delayed in the event of the life-threatening hemorrhage. Now, what should be the optimal mode, place, and timing of the birth? The timing of the uh, delivery for the woman with the red cell antibodies that can cause fetal anemia will depend upon the antibody level or titers and rate of the rise as well as the fetal therapy that has been required. The mode, timing, and the place of the delivery are otherwise depending on the standard of static ground. If the 
the woman is at risk of requiring significant transfer, it would be better to transfer her care to a center capable of processing cross match sample and providing appropriate compatible blood rapidly. And as these high risk pregnancies, continuous electronic fetal heart rate monitoring is required during as advised during labor. Now, what cord blood investigation should be performed if the woman has sick, clinically significant antibodies? Then the cord blood sample should be taken for the direct anti-globulin test, hemoglobin, and bilirubin levels. Now, how should the neonate be managed? Okay, this depends upon the risk of the hemolysis or anemia confirmed by the relevant red cell antibody. The neonate should have regular assessment for its neurobehavioral behavioral state as and can be observed for the development of the jaundice and anemia. Regular assessment of the bilirubin and hemoglobin level is also necessary. An early discharge is not as advisable. Mother is encouraged to feed the baby regularly to guard against dehydration since dehydration can increase the severity of the jaundice. And clinicians should be aware that if bilirubin level rises above the specific threshold, then phototherapy or exchange transfusion may be required. And pregnancy is complicated by the rat cell anomalization with a minimal or no risk of fetal or neonatal anemia requires no specific treatment. Now, what is the risk of recurrence in the future pregnancy? A woman with a history of pregnancy or infant affected by hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn should be referred for early assessment to a fetal medicine specialist in all the further pregnancies. Now, what are the long-term consequences for the woman? Women should be advised that there are no long-term health uh, adverse health consequences associated with the presence of red cell antibodies. Now, what are the long-term health concerns for the children of the woman with red cell antibodies during pregnancy? Clinicians should be aware that some infants may experience anemia persisting for a few weeks of uh, following birth. And clinicians should be aware that some infants may develop late anemia, which is usually due to hyporegenerative anemia. So, this is all about the management of the woman with the red cell antibody. Thank you so much for your cooperation.